I lived in Shiraz for a time in the 1970s when I was studying Persian at the university. While I was there, I was taken to a small but elegant house, an early 19th century residence that had been the home of one of Shiraz's most famous sons, Muhammad Ali Shirazi, the Bab. He is revered today by millions around the world as the first prophet of the Baha'i religion, which began in Iran. My doctoral thesis was devoted to him and his movement. The charming house was the holiest site for the Baha'is in Iran. Here it is again in 1979, and here is the inelegant mosque that was built over the site. Shortly after the Islamic Revolution, the clerical masters of Iran embarked on a campaign to demolish every single holy site and every cemetery belonging to members of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'is were, and still are, the largest religious minority in Iran, and the men in turbans would love nothing more than to exterminate them. Holding back only because of the international stink it would raise, Instead, they persecute them, hanging not just their leaders, but even, in one famous case, a 15-year-old girl for the heinous crime of teaching a Sunday school, morality lessons for children. Hundreds of Baha'is are serving long sentences in jail, goaded by their jailers that if they would only recant their faith, they would be made free again. Young Baha'is are forbidden to attend any institute of higher learning, even those with outstanding academic grades. When the Baha'is set up their own online university, the teachers were arrested and thrown in prison. The long-term aim is to rid the country of the Baha'is while inflicting as much pain on them as possible. Islam is not tolerant of heretics and apostates, and that's the case even when the group being persecuted is not even a remote threat. Baha'is believe in world peace, universal brotherhood, tolerance, equality of the sexes and more, and they are forbidden to resort to violence. They are even commanded, as a religious principle, to obey the government of whatever country they live in. But there is something else that deeply upsets the clerical regime. The Baha'is have their holiest shrines and their international center in Israel. The second Baha'i prophet was exiled to the Holy Land and died there in 1892. His successors stayed there and over the years a major center for the religion was established in Haifa. The remains of the Bab were brought to Mount Carmel and buried in this golden domed shrine. Gardens were built around it, covering the flank of the mount, and gradually more buildings were added until an arc of white marble edifices was created, including the grand pillared seat of the Supreme International Baha'i Governing Body, the Universal House of Justice. Today, the center in Haifa and the shrine of Baha'u'llah near Akko form a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Pilgrims come to Haifa from every corner of the globe. The Israeli government does not threaten to undo any of this. Instead, it works closely with the Baha'is as they expand their center. The Israeli law for the protection of holy places is applied rigidly. Every synagogue, church and mosque in the country is under state protection and the Baha'i World Center enjoys the same privileges as any other sacred site. The Iranian regime that hangs and imprisons the peace-loving people for their beliefs is today a major threat to Israel and the entire Middle East. Iran's leaders vow to wipe Israel from the map. They are building a massive arsenal of ballistic missiles and are working again to build nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, they fund and man terrorist entities from Hamas in Gaza to Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria to the Houthis in Yemen. They threaten war with Saudi Arabia, 
They are the greatest threat to world peace. Yet the international community, the USA, the EU and the UN, are more than happy to do deals with Iran for oil, for diplomatic advantage, for trade. And the same nations vilify the only free and democratic state in the Middle East and far beyond, Israel. Given the story I have just told about a land that persecutes its own children and another land that gives unstintingly a foreign religion the safety and protection it deserves, does it not seem perverse that the UN, the United Nations Human Rights Council, the European Union and the US administration smile fondly on the persecutors and defame the protectors? Perhaps perversity is not quite the right word. Moral depravity might do better, a total absence of any moral compass. In the end, where would you rather live? In the land of the Ayatollahs that executes almost more people than China, that hangs teenagers for teaching moral values to children, that crushes all dissent, or in a country pressed on all sides by war and terror, threatened with genocide by its enemies, which nonetheless has the inner strength and moral conviction to extend its hand to all who arrive on its shores in search of protection. This is Dennis McKeown in Newcastle-upon-Tyne for the Gatestone Institute.